Welcome to the British Library and tonight's digital event, Be Your Own Hero, celebrating the feminist icon, Nawal El Sadawi. And friends of the British Library who come to our events regularly will know our brilliant chair, Khadija Sisse, who's brought together an expert panel all of whose lives connect in different ways to Nawal and her huge legacy. Um, we welcome comments and suggestions and questions. Please put your questions to our expert panel into the, into the platform here. You can also give audience feedback and we really do appreciate that. We love to hear from you. You'll also see that there's a very special offer from Noelle's generous publishers. So if you use the code below, you can buy the books related to this event at a generous discount. Um, you could even donate to the British Library. But in the meantime, enjoy the event and over to you, Khadija. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this special event to honor Dr. Nawal El Sadawi, who sadly passed away on the 21st of March this year, just seven months ago. She would have been 90 years old on the 27th of October. Nawal was last in UK in December 2018 when I arranged for her to give a talk at City University. Those are the kind of things that I would arrange for Nawal. This evening, we are joined by women who Nawal admired, who do amazing work themselves, and they're going to share with us some memories that they have of Nawal, how they worked with her and met her across the globe. We will hear reminiscences, but just as importantly, by the end of the event, we will be talking and thinking about what is happening with the situation of women in Egypt today. And reference that to the global ways that need to be addressed regarding violence against women. And so I'd like to talk to Omnia Amin in Abu Dhabi, where she teaches at the University of Abu Dhabi, um, Robin Morgan in the USA, who is a renowned, internationally renowned feminist an award-winning author and activist, including the classic anthology Sisterhood. Shireen el Feki, an expert on issues of sexuality in the Middle East and North Africa, particularly of, of male sexuality. And also she's an award-winning author and she's based in Canada. And Amel Fami, the director of Tajwen, a gender, based studies group and organization in Egypt that seeks to bring about change that promotes gender equality. And we'll also be sharing information with you through the evening. Um, and you can see it on, on the chat that will be of interest to you. So please check that out. So I'd like to start with you, Dr. Omnia. Dr. Omnia, I mean, I'd like to start with you as you had a special relationship with Nawal. Apart from being one of her translators, in later years, you became her spokesperson as you could not attend an event. How did that relationship develop? And what was it like to work with Dr. Nawal? Hello everyone. And I'm glad that we're honoring such a beautiful woman who passed away, as you said, on the 21st of March, which in Egypt is Mother's Day. So it uh, couldn't have been more ironic that we lost a mother on Mother's Day. To speak about how I met Noel, it's, I think we've all met Noel at one point uh, or so in our lives. You meet her through her writings, you meet her through conferences, you meet her in class, you meet her as a guest of honor at the university, even people meeting her in the street. And uh, my relationship with her just developed. Um, of course, I met her first through Woman at Point Zero. Uh, where I was reading her novel. And then by coincidence, if anything is a coincidence, I was attending um, the one and only uh, time that Nawal Sadawi was ever invited to give a talk um, at um, Egyptian University. It was um, a conference on comparative literature at, hosted at Cairo University in the year 2002. And um, amazingly, uh, she just defied everything. Like uh, she walked in there. The first thing she said was that she's 71 years old. She um, also spoke about creativity, courage, uh, the need to be yourself. And she wasn't liked among the audience. I just simply slipped after um, the talk and introduced myself. 
and lo and behold, she, she asked me over to her place. That was it. It just needed no introduction. And I'm sure that each and every one of you here, when you met Noel, it was just like so smooth. And I said before that knowing Noel and loving Noel between us, we don't need any introduction. Like just someone says, I love reading Noel Sadawi or I met her. This is the introduction that I need. And if anything, I would like to say that meeting Noel is because she, this woman had the gift of giving. She gave. She, uh, she gave not just talking, she opened her heart, she opened her mouth, she opened her door. Uh, she was just there for everyone who came across her in the street, uh, in the taxis, she spoke to taxi drivers. So it's, um, it was just a very natural way of um, kind of like becoming close to her. I think she's close to herself. This is why she's able to be close to others. And if anything I've learned from Noel, it is um, kind of like be yourself. She liked one thing and she loved one thing and she looked for it in people. It's are you being you or are you imitating others? And this is how we became close because she told me, you don't imitate anyone. And in fact, I don't. I love Noel, but I don't imitate her. And um, uh, this is what brought us together more than anything else and made her believe in me. So uh, it was just a natural friendship that developed. And it had nothing to do with age. When I met Noel, I was half her age, exactly half her age. And it had, uh, she um, looked beyond age, gender, uh, religion, you name it. She broke all borders and just looked at the human being in front of her. And I am ever so grateful um, that I met her in person. And uh, I'm ever so grateful that we still have uh, all these videos and talks uh, that I can hear her over and over and over again and still read her books. Uh, they still sound new every time I book. I, I pick up a book that I read before, I find something that speaks to me. And, and this is what I call the gift of giving. Mm. Mm. I love that photo with you with her in the kitchen because that just was so natural with her in the kitchen at the beginning. That was really great. But as well, like you, like you said, she wanted you to be your own person, which is why I called it Be Your Own Hero because I made that mistake too of saying, no, well, you're my hero. She goes, no, I'm not. <laughs> be your own hero. Everybody should be their own hero. So for me, that is something that, that that's stuck out that resonated quite a lot but also um Omnia could you also maybe say a bit about like I say people knew Noir as a public figure for about equality and justice and particularly for women and and, and but how does her body of work her body of written work reflect some of this because you knew her intimately also through her writing okay well since you're speaking about written work let me share with you what she says about writing. She says, writing lifts a man above what is called manhood and lifts a woman above what is called womanhood. Writing lifts a human being above all the differences that prevail between us. If one act was very important for Noel and changed her life and made her whom the person we need to speak about after she passed away, it's the act of writing. Mm -hmm. She saw in the act of writing salvation, not just the salvation for her as an individual, of course, it starts with the personal, but it's the salvation for her um, whole generation and for generations to come. Because uh, through the act of writing, she told me that writing needs courage. Mm -hmm. You cannot pick up a pen and write if you do not have the courage to say what you thought inside and to believe in what um, you're saying. 
So she, this is why she said that the act of writing is the most dissident act you can <laughs> carry out. Because for her, dissidence is not just about um, going against the current. If the current is what is wonderful and uh, is just and uh, guarantees uh, your rights, she goes with the flow. But the act of writing comes out of a need to say that something is not um, in its right place. And uh, yeah. Noel wrote about what she thought, wrote about um, her life. Her life is one of a long, a lifelong militancy. Everything mm -hmm. this woman said, everything this woman did was just like about change. Yeah. And for her, change is revolution. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Do you know She's what kind of book she read herself? What, do you know what kind of book she enjoyed reading? Mm -hmm. I'm she sure they would have been about, you know, yeah. written as uh, well, but... Every time I visited her, she was reading a different book. She, she read in Arabic, she read in English, and she actually wished that she knew more languages to read things in their original mm -hmm. uh, writing. But um, mm -hmm. she read philosophy, she read history, she read, uh, she read novels. I think she enjoyed a novel the most. Uh, when yes. she was in uh, Dubai, I remember she told me, who are the new writers? Go and bring me some books. Yeah. And uh, to receive a book, it was the greatest gift that you could ever gift a woman like her. So uh, she always told me, mm -hmm. you can change the world through the act of reading, the act of writing, and engaging with others in dialogue. Mm -hmm. When I um, asked her, uh, how would you like me to introduce you, you know, uh, in... Um, yeah on a recent uh, conference and she basically said, tell people that the word that lives forever is the word that carries the truth. And my words carried the truth. I'm not sure if we're not getting you there. Yeah. I'm not sure if we got that last little bit of you there because you were cutting out, but if we get some little time, we're gonna come back to that because I think I'm sure people would like to know what um, the, the kind of things that Noel read too. But I'd like to speak, uh, Robin, to maybe speak to a little bit about this now as well, because you also knew her in, through her writing because she contributed to your anthologies, but you know, but you would have met her at conferences as well. And, I, and as I did, went to some conferences with her, what was she like? Uh, Give us another aspect of her international feminism. First of all, Khadija, thank you for organizing this event. It really means a great deal to those of us who loved her passionately. And thanks to the British Museum as well. Um, I first met Nawal, I knew her for a very long time, and I first met her in the late 1970s when I was compiling my anthology, Sisterhood is Global. And there was one obvious evident person to do Egypt, and that was El Sadawi. Um, and uh, because Hatshepsut was no longer with us to do Egypt, so we had to settle for now on. Uh, she, uh, she agreed, I wrote her, she agreed, she wrote the piece, she gave it to her typist because she wrote longhand, um, and, uh, and the next day she was arrested by Sadat. Oh my God. So, uh, you know, she was afraid that her typist would somehow be implicated by possessing this incendiary manuscript about women's rights. So she got word somehow to her typist to destroy the manuscript, which her typist did. So I was in double despair. I was not very worried about Nawal and I was very worried about the peace on Egypt. Um, but my friend and colleague, Gloria Steinem had recently been to Egypt as a tourist. And because she was a celebrity, she had been invited to meet those in power, including the Sadats, which neither Nawal nor I, being mischievous types, ever would have stooped to meet. But she met them. Um, and so I leveraged Gloria uh, to, uh, to call Madame Sadat because she had been given her private number. So we were on um, extension phones and she called Madame Sadat 
Uh, and to our, we thought it would be for her assistant, but to our shock, she picked up the phone herself. So we immediately both pled for Nawal's release. We pled for her ill health. We, we diplomatically stayed away from politics. We didn't deny them, but we stayed away from them. We just talked about her ill health. Um, and uh, of course, Madam Sadat, she apologized and she said there was absolutely nothing she could do. And then the very next day, Nawal was released. Pillow talk. So uh, she rewrote the entire piece. Uh, and it still shines like glory in the anthology. And then we became very good friends for many, many, many decades. Um, we sometimes argued over whether it was patriarchy or whether it was capitalism that was to blame for absolutely everything that was wrong with humanity. Um, but whenever she came to New York, we, we had dinner, we laughed, we cried, we embraced, we argued, we agreed, we adored each other. We, we recognized each other as mischief makers. Um, and uh, we said, we used to say that nobody had really lived until they'd been in jail. Uh, so when I went to Egypt and route to Palestine to work with women there, I stayed with her both in Cairo and then her then not yet finished little house in the country on the Nile where she even cooked for me, not well, but she cooked for me. She said, I do not pride myself on being a cook but it was delicious. And the interesting thing to me there was that when we went for a walk, village women came running up to her and tugged at her sleeve and her garments and said, Dr. Nawal, Dr. Nawal. And it was great love because she, even though she was a world renowned figure to them, she was Dr. Nawal. She was the person who delivered a baby. Ask you about, I was gonna ask you about how, how people drew to her. Yeah, she, 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 she was the person who would set a broken bone if one of their kids had a broke a leg or an arm. She was their friend. Um, so we, we did that. Uh, and I was amazed at the, the intimacy with which they addressed her. And of course, she responded. Um, and, and then in Cairo, we played tourist for a few days. We rode camels, which I had never done and which Nawal had never done either. Um, and, uh, and I realized when I, after I was in Egypt, only then did I realize that it was, she inevitably argued the contrary wherever she was. In other words, they're fiercely defending feminism to Marxists and then fiercely defending Marxism to me. <laughs> so the years came and went and husbands came and went, um, but the politics and the friendship <laughs> They did. And the politics and the friendship continued and, and in fact deepened. We talked about health. We talked, you know, when you're young, you talk about um, uh, lovers and politics. And when you're older, you talk about doctors and politics. Um, and uh, when Tahrir Square blossomed with the temporary democracy, we phoned each other and we were just ecstatic. Um, and, and in fact, the last time that I saw her, we did a woman of the world um, conference together for which Nawal um, uh, insisted that I am, was her partner for the conversation and interview her because as she put it, we made good mischief together. <laughs> and we did, we did, we made very good mischief together. She, she was breathless over Tahrir Square with excitement in that <gasps> way that she would get with her wonderful mane of white hair flying to <gasps> Robin, Robin, they put me and here I am, I'm almost 90. They put me in, in on a motorcycle. They rode me around the square and <laughs> cheered for me. Um, and, and how she spent the night there in a tent in Tahrir. Um, and how she, yeah, I mean, she, she, look, the planet is, drab and drearier without her because she radiated magnificence that's what she did and her work I remember was, there was her the work demonstration was, in the uk when she came here once and she was due to she was due to go to the airport but they said oh there was a demonstration for something and it's in central she goes well i have to go to the demonstration first i said oh, yeah. well you don't have time <laughs> Oh yeah, no, no, no. What, yeah. The demonstration, everything stopped because you had to go do that immediately. Yeah, and her writing yeah, will live. First. Her writing will live um, uh, long past her, and and will sing 
on the page. Uh, as writers, we used to complain to each other, there's never enough time for writing. When you're on barricades, you feel guilty that you're not at your typewriter or your computer, and when you're, and vice versa. Um, but we loved that complaint, and we did both, because you, you, what you poured onto the page was meaningless unless it was the voice of women, unless you were a vehicle for that. And, uh, and she always has been, and her work will live and, and be as magnificent as she was. Yeah. Oh, I miss her so. I think so, because even when people were, were joining us for, uh, said they were going to join us for this session, people are just discovering some of her work. And some of us are looking like, but we've known about this for a long time. But the, the joy that other people are now having to discover her work is great. You know, you just almost wish you could rediscover that work yourself and have that same joy. But you know that these people are going to be absolutely, you know, exuberant once in when they, when they read her work. Is there any other kind of special memory that you have of her that you, you want to share with us? Ah, uh, well, there's, there's just many. Already. Especially when I, I really like the idea of how people. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. But yeah, especially I remember people, the way that she drew people to her. Well, well, she 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 came at one point and um, Ms. Magazine held a reception for her. And, and she didn't want to take up, there were only a few chairs. So she sat on mm -hmm. the floor. We sat on the floor together. Um, you know, I mean, there was a complete lack of pretension about her. Um, yeah. In fact, she, <laughs> she was much more grounded um, than I in my somewhat flighty, um, uh, excessive political, um, not political correctness, but political obeisance was when, when we went to um, the, this village women in Egypt in, in, on the Nile, she's on the, it's the Nile, she said. Um, when, we, when we went to visit them, uh, it's, many of them were living in very poor circumstances. Uh, and she, they brought, they had one chair that they brought out, you know, for her. And she said, no, 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 no. And they insisted and she sat in the chair. And then they brought another chair for me. And I said, no, 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 no. And she said, take it. And I didn't. And I sat on the ground with them. And afterwards, she said to me, you, for the first time, acted like an American. And I said, what, what, oh, God, help me. What did I do? She said, uh, you sat on the floor and you are going to come away scratching. And I did. I, when, I, when, I, when I crossed the border and I went into Palestine, I had lice. Yeah. So she was very, she was a doctor. You know, she never forgot she was a physician as well as a fine yeah. first-rate writer. Um, and she, she, she doused me in the shower. She put stuff on my head. She did all the, Robin, 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 you have to do this. Um, there was no brooking her. There was no, there was no standing in the way of this force majeure that, that she was, mm -hmm. as well as being the essence of elegance at the same time she was a woman totally in of women and of the people. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much for that. Thank, um, you. thank you, Shireen. I'm going to come to you now because um, it did Noel introduced us, but we'd like, I mean, well, no, and Noel introduced me to uh, Omnia and Robin as well, but how, um, but how did you meet Noel? So I and knew, when I knew about Noelle long before I had ever met her in person or read her works. My uh, father is Egyptian, he's a neurosurgeon, and he studied at Cairo University Medical School in the 1950s. And my father would talk about his salad days and how he had this really close coterie of friends he met um, effectively over a corpse in the dissection. Room. And he would talk about their escapades. And this is a lifelong professional and personal uh, connection. And I asked him, Dad, were there any women in your group? And he said, yes, they were. If there were a few, they were a year older than us because it was thought women were less mature than men, strangely, uh, by the system. He said, and there was this one girl and she was so bossy and she was always saying how things could be done better. And in particular, she was always saying how we, the men, could improve. Well, no surprise there. It was Noel. <laughs> and what's interesting is that, you know, Noelle, we know, was a deaf can with a scalpel. I love the story 
of her uh, <laughs> ultimatum to her uh, second husband. For those of you who are not familiar with it, the long story there, he chucked her manuscript out a window. She left out after it. She was pregnant at the time. So the pregnancy was terminated. There's, there's a drama to that. But essentially, she asked him for a divorce. And he said, I think something to the effect, uh, my dear, you will sooner see the stars at midday than you will get a divorce from me. And then she basically went at him with a scalpel. <laughs> suddenly, it was a combination of midnight, stars at midnight at, at high noon, and she got exactly what she was. <laughs> but, and I love, you know, I love those stories because actually I, she was, she was the mistress of dissection, not just literally, but also figuratively, because if you look at her work and given my work on sexuality in the Arab region, I've been most engaged in her writings on sex, uh, including uh, women and sex and hidden face of Eve, you, you see her lay out the, the issues in, in really anatomical detail, I mean, the regulation of female sexuality, whether it's through FGM or the primacy of virginity and all the reflections of the power of patriarchy and how this is mirrored in repressive laws around inheritance and marriage and polygamy and of course the, the issues of sexual violence. And what I think is most interesting about her writings on this, and, and it's really shocking, is because the issues that she laid bare 50 years ago, are alive and kicking in Egypt and across the Arab region today. I'll, I'll just give you one example, if that's okay, Khadija. Great. So essentially, it, it's just long passages on the hymen, and it's basically hymen 101, right? You know, what is it? <laughs> Why it doesn't, you know, always bleed and, you know, the different, you know, the, all the colors and rainbows of the hymen, basically, right? And you, you fast forward to today and that, that lack of insight and knowledge and the primacy of the hymen is, is still there. And, and to give you one example, uh, my work focuses on uh, HIV AIDS. Uh, and I was once out with an outreach group in uh, Casablanca and a fantastic group. They're trying to prevent HIV. They were handing out condoms. We were going into bars, talking to female sex workers. And we met these two young, um, two young hairdressing students and they were turning tricks for you know, pocket change, to you know, buy clothes and mobile phones and all that. And these fantastically dedicated uh, outreach workers tried to give them condoms. And these girls said, no, 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 we don't need condoms. We will never get pregnant because we want to get married. And therefore we only do anal and oral sex. So we are virgins. So, wow. <laughs> so what's interesting about this at so many levels is effectively, what Noel was speaking to and what is still present in the region is the gap between appearance and reality. I mean, this is one example. This is virginity defined by a piece of anatomy rather than by a state of chastity. And what's interesting about that is that I think in Noel's writing, she tried to bring the two closer together. Mm -hmm. and, and that is key, not just in our private lives, but also in public life and political life. In, across yeah. the Arab region, because if you don't close the gap on the one, it, the other will not necessarily follow. They have to go in, in sync. Um, and so what Noel really did, I think, is take these private whisperings and broadcast them, and in fact, they shout them out. Uh, and, and what you see today, and, and Amal, my friend and colleague, can speak much more to this, is really that you see these conversations continuing but of course they're taking place on social media on the internet and you find that the the voices are being heard but perhaps in in these sort of meta spaces that exist somewhere in the no woman's land between public and private life the challenge of course is that the conversations are proliferating but the difficulty is translating a talk into action hmm. And to my mind, yeah, that, yeah, is, that, mm -hmm. that yeah. is one of the limitations of, I think, Noelle's legacy, really. I mean, to use a medical metaphor, I think she was much stronger on diagnosis than she was on prescription for a lot of the ills that she laid bare. 
And in my experience, sometimes her scalpel could be replaced with a sledgehammer. I chaired an event in London in which she was the star attraction and it was full of young people, young women and young men, and they were clearly starstruck and hanging on her every word. And a young woman stood up, she was Mahagava, she was wearing her head was covered, and she asked a question about Noelle's work. And Noelle basically dismantled her because she was wearing hijab and, you know, this was a symbol of oppression. Uh, and how could this young woman be so deluded? And it was shocking, actually. And it was interesting. I talked with a number of the young women uh, in the audience after that, and they were, you know, frankly gobsmacked because for them, there was this cognitive dissonance of, 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 of a woman whose ideas spoke to their dreams of freedom. And yet she had difficulty really conceiving that their notions of fulfillment might be different to her own. So I would say in sort of looking back on Noelle, you know, she was, I don't, I don't think, I think she had many fans and she had many followers, but I don't think she catalyzed, she started, she didn't create a movement. But, but that being said, I mean, she was a catalyst for action. I was there in her salons that she had in the wake of the uprisings in 2011. And I saw the young people as in the event in London, I mean, clearly transfixed. And if you have a moment, I'll just tell you one interesting story of how, she, how her presence, I mean, her, 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 her just, just the sheer force of her, the bringing all these people together was a catalyst for action because I was there in this meeting, it was, you know, packed, you know, her flat was in Shubra, I think, and it was just packed to the gills. And it was 95% female, and they were basically disemboweling the patriarchy. There was this one chap who was nodding, you know, energetically at all the critique of manhood. And I, I, I talked to him afterwards. He was a student. And he said, you know what? You know, I'm 21 years old, and I am expected to effectively be the guardian for my sister, who's 25. I have to go out with her everywhere, even when she's with her fiancé. And frankly... You know, I have to stay up and wait for her when she comes home. Yeah. You know, this is not what I want. I want to live my life. I think she should live her life. But you know what? This, this being a man in this society, it's a privilege. But I can tell you, it's a huge pressure. Now, what's interesting about that is I got me thinking because so much of the research I had done around sexuality, I had heard mainly women's voices. And it's, it's not because I didn't try to talk to men. It's just that they didn't have things that were particularly interesting to say. And it occurred to me there just wasn't space to really hear about men's views, about their intimate selves, about how they saw themselves as men and how they saw their roles changing in relation to the changing roles and rights of women. Because masculinity studies at the time was not really developed in, 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 in the region. So fast forward a couple of years later, uh, I joined with a group called uh, Promundo, which is a leading NGO, which is uh, engaging with men and boys on gender equality. And thanks to UN Women and the Swedish government, we launched this huge study, about 15,000, you know, almost 15,000 now participants, men and women in seven countries, including in Egypt, talking about what is it to be a man today. Uh, and you know, the, the findings that we have both uh, confirm, but also confound much of what uh, Noel observed. And that came effectively from being in Noel's presence, for being in that intellectual foment that she uh, created. Um, and so I'll, I'll stop there because I'm gonna hand off to Amel, who has been, a, you know, as I said, a friend, but also a collaborator on this work on men and masculinities. And she has some fantastic uh, findings from the field and how Noel's observations connect to the reality in Egypt today. So mm. over to you. Yeah, it'll be great to hear from her because I, I'll then put in something in terms of that kind of thing that was happening in the UK when when we would have, uh, when she would speak to men when they came to her events. So it'll be good to hear what uh, Hamel, Amel has to say. Yes, please, Amel. Amel is the director of Tajwen, the gender center in Egypt. Um. Thank you, Hadida, and I'm really happy to be with this amazing crowd um, in a very special day. I, I did meet Noelle in several meetings. I never had um, the honor to talk to her in person, 
um, but uh, but uh, of course my, her writing has affected me uh, tremendously and when I started my career and um, I, I like to start from the end not from the start um, uh, in March uh, when, the, when Noelle died this year uh, this year I mean before she died, there was a tweet um, from her official uh, site uh, on Twitter. It says, I, I will die and you will die. The important thing is how you, how you lived your life until you die. And I thought that is brilliant. Uh, it's just, it's just uh, uh, there are a lot, uh, we can see how Nouvelle have affected. We can see um, the critiques, um, by feminist Egyptians as, as well as Arab Egyptians to Noel. You can see claims uh, that uh, Noel was more famous and celebrated in the West than her own country, Egypt. We can talk about how Western media and academia often like uh, overemphasize her influence, but we also can, we can talk that and that's debates that is there as Shireen said, but also we can talk about um, how uh, when she died unexpectedly personally to me, how what, what there has been a really huge argument over social media by young feminists who is defending her, uh, how she affected them, her really roles and how she really guided the, them through their um, being, uh, starting um, uh, their careers or starting being knowing about uh, like being feminist, young feminist and reading her books. And it was really interesting that that we might not see um, uh, her um, like creation of a movement, um, but we could see um, like other, like other feminists. But we could also see how her ideologies, her writings, as Omnia has said, uh, have really shaped a lot of young Egyptians um, uh, girls. And it was really interesting for, for some of you who might have followed debates on the Egyptian social media during after her death um, and um, the, the, the statement and the stories that come from the young, from uh, the younger generation of how she influenced them. For me, I want to talk a little bit about what we do in Tigreen, but also how uh, some of Noelle's uh, work, uh, earlier work had influenced us. Noelle have wrote on on FGM, which I think is it's it, uh, I think it's one of the earliest pieces uh, that that an, a feminist Egyptian feminist writer would talk about FGM. She she wrote in 1971 uh, in her book Women and Sex about uh, FGM and um, and uh, and the patriarchal oppression and how it's uh, how the control of, of women's sexuality then in her book in 1977 the hidden face of eve Noel told her own personal story of circumcision and she talked about her being subjected to fgm she have described undergoing the practice in the bathroom floor and where her mother had been overlooking her which was for for me personally has been traumatizing the experience she's putting her heart into writing such a an experience about FGM was very inspiring to me. And uh, from, from the day I read the story till fast forward 25 years after, even more, I have been working on FGM. And I've been um, uh, one of, of the, like, I, would say, I don't know, but I, I, I consider myself uh, and, uh, and the organization I founded is one of the major player on FGM in, in, in Egypt. And uh, before I've also, I've been with the uh, WHO working on FGM on, at an international capacity. So it's just the words, uh, voicing the words, uh, talking about this and the experience have really inspired uh, um, uh, a whole years and years of work on FGM in, in my home country, Egypt. Um, I wanna talk about um, how uh, some of the things she have said uh, earlier like uh, in, in, in 50 years ago, are, um, she voiced them and we still struggle with them till date. When Noel talked about FGM in particular, and I wanna, I wanna um, single out the female genital mutilation and whoever listening right now don't know that it's a practice that's widely practiced in 13 country, 30 countries, including Egypt. 
Egypt is one of the highest country that practice female genital mutilation with more than 93% of ever married women who've undergone the practice. And because we are 120 million Egyptians, half of them are, are, are women, we have the highest uh, pop, uh, women uh, population coherent who have undergone the practice. Um, uh, and um, uh, FGM in Egypt is practiced among girls at the age, at the average age of, of, of 10 years old. And when Noelle first voiced uh, um, or her, her own experience and also uh, advocated against the FGM, um, it, that was in the 70s, we didn't have a law, we didn't have um, a religious uh, fatwa or, t or an announcement uh, denouncing practice. And she struggled alone. Uh, and, and, and talking about FGM is a taboo. After years and years of her uh, uh, like voicing out in FGM and feminist organizations and activists working in FGM, now um, we have a law against FGM. We have um, uh, an, an Islamic uh, fatwa against it. We have a lot of interventions mm -hmm. against it, but still, but she have mentioned early uh, in 50 years ago about how FGM is very uh, really tight or very uh, strongly connecting to female sexuality is still an issue that we're struggling with. In the work that have been done over years in Egypt on FGM, it's rarely seldomly touched upon issues of sexuality in FGM. It's always talked about it as a medical issue. So it, we, now we have medicalization. We talked about it at uh, culture and practices, all this religious teaching, never, never been touched upon about issues of sexuality and controlling female sexuality in relation to FGM, which is to uh, surprisingly, like this is something Noel voiced out 50 years ago and still here, um, now, after 50 years in Egypt, we just say, if we don't address FGM from a sexuality and controlling sexuality of women and oppressing women's uh, like uh, uh, ability and right to pleasure, these are the main issue. This is the core heart of the problem. So this woman have been ahead of us many years, 50 years ago. I mean, it might not have created the wave we wanted, but the knowledge uh, was there, she voiced it. And uh, right now, uh, after 50 years, we are just saying and echoing what she have been saying uh, a long, long time ago. Oh, that time. So, so uh, I, I actually uh, think um, that uh, she has very much contributed to a lot of the, the things we are really working and still struggling with. She has been definitely a woman ahead of her time. Um, yes, we do know um, we do know the limitation of the discourse, and we know a lot of the challenges. But we need to acknowledge also uh, her um, really, really uh, great impact on younger generation, and, and especially what I've seen in, I've seen it, uh, the last few months after her death. Um, for, I hope she somehow she would have felt all the love. <laughs> that all the young women have been spreading around all social media, uh, thinking about her, putting pictures if they have met her, writing words and quoting her. Uh, there have been a kind of a celebratory moment over internet after her death. Right. I think not only just the, the young women, but also young men as well. <laughs> <laughs> You know? I leave that to Shireen. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, but no, in terms of when she would gather uh, youth to her apartments to discuss, she really wanted to get involved and know that the youth movement was going on. And, and a couple of her assistants at some time that she introduced me to them were young women as well. So she was really, when we were talking about FGM, she was also really against, um, you know, boys being circumcised. And she would talk about that. And when they would come, um, and come and discuss things at events, at, at least in the UK as well. She would always, you know, she'd like to call people up onto the stage so she could have a one-on-one -on -one with them almost. And in, inside that group, she would always include men and she always wanted to know what was going on for them as well. Um, you know, because of course we, we have to consider and make sure that they know what young women are going through as well. If we're going to get going to get through this this violence that is happening globally, I mean against women, it's so interesting 
to hear what is going on in Egypt. And it's really great, Amel, for you to let us know what her, how, her, how she's impacted, um, especially like young people, because of, of course the next generation, but just even in terms of what young people and what women are thinking in Egypt now um, and how we're going to get through this and the work that you're doing, I can imagine she would have to know that, you know, that you inspired her to do this would have been great. You know, and sometimes we need people like that just to inspire other people. So it's not one of those people, not everybody can do everything. So if she was there and she can inspire people. But then we know she also, I remember uh, in South uh, Africa, she had to get up there for breakfast because she wanted to meet all of us before breakfast. And she said, okay, we have to have an organization where there's um, African women, sub-Saharan African women writers and Arab women writers. Why are we not doing things together? And you all now need to sort it out. Now that I've brought you together, we had to do that before breakfast. We really didn't know we were going to do that, but this is what Noel told us we were going to do. So we did it. <laughs> you know, I don't think the person who, who was nominated to do it actually did it, but she was really intent that because we were there and we had the ability to be together and discuss this, she wanted to motivate and inspire us to do that. So it's, and so like I said, in, in terms of, it's not often we will get to hear what is really going on, the, on on the ground in Egypt. So we really thank you for that. But I've just got one question before we throw it out to the uh, to um, people who are listening. And really it's drawing on again um, on linking with Lowell's legacy and the work that's been going on. Um, and that was to ask you about how do you think Noel's legacy of activism in, in the work can be directed positively in the future, which you've kind of spoken to a bit to Amel, but no, how do you think her legacy of activism going on in the future can be directed positively? What can we do? What else can other people do to work towards the global problem of violence against women? Um, and I know that's a, like a bit of a heavy question, but what do you think is one of the, I'll throw it to Amel first, what do you think is one of the main things that we need to either consider and, and do? Uh, I, I think Noelle have always engaged um, in her work on issues of women. She have just engaged uh, male domination, class domination, new colonization. I mean, I, I, would, I would add now new liberalism. But I also think the way she engaged um, religion um, has been a little bit of a controversy. Um, and I think we need to to revisit that. I mean, there have been like, um, and Shireen have touched a little bit about, about them. I mean, we, we just have to really kind of engage to, to widen how she had the views in, in her recent, she had been very much critiqued in her recent views about um, religion. And I know some, some might not agree with me, but, but also I'm talking about the reality in Egypt at the ground. We have to be very, uh, very conscious of what's happening and how the young people are, are, um, are really um, relating to that. So I would definitely uh, take from what you have built and really re-engage uh, re uh, discussion on how the religion, uh, what uh, people have, like how the religion is really um, overarching the issues of women, uh, women sexuality. I, I, in my work, I always try to shy away from religion. This has been very, very um, uh, tough subject for uh, when working with FGM. Yeah. But I think we really re we need to re-engage with it in this era and, um, and, and kind of listen and kind of see how the younger generation are really um, open and open discourse around it. And, and, and that what I would take. I will take that a further, um, further work on, on, uh, on these issues, uh, on, on issues of religion and discourses around religion in particular. That is, that is in my, my personal talk, uh, take from, from Elise. Wonderful. Seeing the work Thank the you. Ground. Thank you. I'll just encourage people who are listening to please send your questions. We're going to come to you in a moment. So Omnia, I know you've been sitting there since <laughs> we, we've started and you started us off. What would you think in terms of um, Noelle's work, in terms of the activism work, what do we need to do to take that forward positively? Well, if we are to um, 
take one slogan from all of what Noel has done, I think the best that represents her is lifting the veil of the mind. Mm -hmm. you know, she always said, uh, try and lift the veil of the mind. And as much as this one simple sentence has been misinterpreted to say she's against hijab, she's against this, she's against whatever, whatever. But uh, Noel always was very aware of how manipulation um, and thought enslavement was embedded in everything, mm -hmm. like in media, in uh, in in. Um, the political agenda, in uh, world economy, in all of this, she was just like aware. And she said, just be aware. Don't take things for face value. Always see what is behind things. And um, I, she's one of those very few people who saw the whole picture. Because uh, when she spoke about this, she would say, look at things from the very beginnings. So she would tie things with history, like yeah. historically how things started, pa patriarchy, uh, politics, uh, global economic system. Uh, it, it's somehow all tied together and especially religious ideologies. So she really never mm. left anything unturned. And um, yeah. I, she was advocating at the very end the same, very same thing since she started. Um, I think Amal also touched upon this, but she's, she always said, I'm asking that there should be equality between men and women in the family court. And this is something we still have yes. to work on. And she said, yes. uh, men mm -hmm. and women should be equal in the constitution. And we're still mm -hmm. working towards this. And then she always also called for the constitution should be secular to include everyone. And um, 50 years after uh, she started with all these things, we're still in the same vicious circle. The I'm work is saying. not done. Yeah, so yeah. I love to see that. Um, she said that the, a real revolution is a revolution that starts with the self. Absolutely. And that a real revolution is one that is not organized by any party, but it is one that comes from lifting the veil from the mind of the masses, and they walk together towards what they want. So I'm going to stop you there. Thank you. And Bobby. if I may, I would like to add one small thing in agreement with Amal, if that's possible. Yeah, um, absolutely. I'm coming to you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes okay. Amal, I couldn't agree more. I, you know, I, her about the link with sexuality. It was in fact that her pointing that out that she got fired as Minister of Health. Do you remember? That's what did it. It was the link with sexuality because of the power inherent in a woman's sexuality and a woman's enjoying herself and a woman being a full human being. Um, but I see, I think that we have, we're not just in the same place. I think it sometimes seems that way because it seems like we're going in a circle, um, but it isn't a circle. It's a spiral, you know, mm -hmm. and I think it's really different. I don't think she was necessarily writing for her own time. <laughs> yeah. uh, because, and of course, naturally, she would ruffle feathers. Oh, oh, oh boy, <laughs> did she ruffle feathers among feminists, among non-feminists, everybody's feathers ruffle, ruffle. But I think she was writing for the young today and for the young in the future, and for the young at a time when, in fact, religion will not be such an incendiary and like conflagration. Um, I think she was, she had cast her sensibility so far afield with such cornucopic generosity um, that she couldn't stop it, you know? I mean, it was gonna go on giving and giving and giving, and that was that. <laughs> uh, and I, I, yeah. I think that was at the heart of her, of her genius. Yeah, I really do. And I think her work will be alive for a very long time. I really do. Even though it might have driven some people, including me at different times, bananas in the now. That doesn't matter, doesn't matter at all. Yeah. yeah.
I, I agree with you there because I know she was really insistent on what she really wanted to do was to get her written works onto TV because she realized for young people that is where they were going to access it was going to access it. Right. The, the young, the young, Robin, the young. You don't yeah. understand the young. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I know. Yeah. But let me throw that, we haven't even got to the questions I've got here, but let me throw that same question to Shireen, because I think you also know around Noel's work, so you can really talk to this really interestingly about this same question, please. I'd love to, but I am also concerned that we're, we, we've, we've talked, it's been a fascinating conversation. Perhaps there were questions from the audience. I'm more okay. than happy. Yep. Okay. <laughs> come back a bit later, because I do want to hear from everyone. With yeah, us. yeah, I know. We just need more time. Well, this is a question that maybe one person can answer. What is the, uh, what do we know from Noelle's early life? Such a powerful you're breaking up. It's hard to understand. Could you just, you're breaking. What, what is that in her? Ah, I don't know. Can you hear me now? Is this better? Yeah. Her, okay. Her early life. What was there in her early life that highlighted that she was going to become a powerful or significant person? Hmm. Uh, let me just say um, something here because. Um, I translated her first memoir ever uh, when she she wrote it when she was 10 years old mm -hmm. and it's called Diary of a Child Called Suad. This yes. is the book. And um, it would have never come to light uh, if it wasn't saved somehow. And she took the pen name of Suad. She called herself Suad and just wrote about her everyday life. Uh, through this character called Suad and reading the diary in Arabic I was like so amazed that that in that young girl was 10 at the time is the Nawal, the Nawal who's sitting in front of me um, I don't know if uh, it was years later like 50 years later uh, with the same ideas with the same critical um, I to see that there's, you know, the child in her, the child always sees the truth. Mm -hmm. so, and Andy, as, what is the title of that book again? I'm sorry, I'm just quoting you here because of the time, but just tell us the title of that book again, because then people can read that to know. Diary of a Child Called Swad. Swad, okay, that's great. So that's the book that people need to get to answer that question. <laughs> You've done it. <laughs> that's really good. Okay, there's an, another question here. Um, but maybe I'll be best to answer is, um, um, what is the best way to honor the memory of Nawal El Sadawi? Who would like to maybe very quickly read say her. one thing? Read her, read her, read her, read her own words. Because one of the things that happens when you become a world figure uh, is that other people interpret you. And sometimes they're right. Sometimes they're spot on. And sometimes they're really spot off. So just let her own words speak for what she stood for, what she believed, and the passion with which she believed them spills out across the page. Her books are still fortunately in print. They're in translation. Uh, they're all over the world. Get those books, the novels, the nonfiction books, and read her. Read her own voice. Mm -hmm. Yes. As you say that her books, so if people can see, we can't see it right now, but you should be able to see it. Both of her publishers in the UK are offering discounts for her books. So take advantage of that and get, as Robin said, buy her books and read them. That is that is how you can best honor her. Yeah, and, and get to know her through there. Shireen, would you like to make a comment about that, please? Uh, in terms of her legacy and, and how to take it yeah. forward. You know, it's yeah, in, a, in a positive direction, yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, so it's been a lot of discourse. I mean, again, I'm, I'm, you know, I was once, I, I was once asked by uh, a Moroccan, uh, eminent Moroccan uh, sociologist, uh, am I a feminist? And this was a decade ago when I started working on sexuality, and I come to this through a background of HIV through public health. So it really threw me the question. Um, I can now say confidently, in large part through uh, the work and you know being acquainted with Noel El Sadawi's work, and of course working with Amal, I am a feminist, but I'm what I call a leapfrog feminist. I went from no feminism to working with men and boys. 
And so in looking at that, I would say that in terms of all that she was talking about in terms of the power of the patriarchy, it is absolutely now key to engage with, with, with the other side of gender, if, if you like. And it, it's, it's become very fashionable. It, it was fashionable for a time to talk about how this, you know, why do they hate us? And, you know, speaking about this sort of culture of hate that Arab men uh, were perceived to have. But actually, Noel wrote about this very tellingly, and, and I just, it, it really stuck with me. And, and he said, the tragedy of the Arab men, um, however, or rather of, for most men the world over, is that they fear women and yet desire her. And I think that's very interesting, the fear element. And it is true that she also spoke to the power of women and how this posed a threat to, uh, to men. And I think that what we're seeing now on the ground, and then certainly we talked about the young men who gravitated to her salons and were inspired by her work, is that we, we are seeing men coming to the table to address a lot of these issues, particularly as they relate to sexual violence. And I think that that in combination with the point that Amal made about religion, because again, Noel talked a lot about how Islam and conservative interpretations of religion box in women. What we don't talk as much about is how narrow interpretations, Islamic fundamentalism, if you like, also box in men in putting them into a space with this idealized vision of manhood, you know, the prophet peace be upon him, which never actually existed. So, I'm going to have yes. to wrap you up here. So, the way to take a is to bring that to <laughs> But I mean, I love, is that it, is, is all of this in, in the, in your, in your book or is these, has this come after your book, what you're discussing now, just because I can direct people to what to read? Um, I would suggest they have a look at www.imagesmena.org, which uh, is the work that we've done with Promundo, Amal and myself on men and masculinities across the region. That's great. I'd just like to direct people to, as I said, look at whatever is in the chat in inverted commas for different links there that you can be directed to Amel's work. Um, and if you, we only had a couple of lines bio for everybody, but everybody here, all the women here, Robin Morgan, Omni Amin, Amel Fami, Cheryl, Shireen El Feki, myself, we're all doing great work. <laughs> so please check out what they're doing in terms, and you can see just how much we're related to what Noel does. Um, and there's also a general email address there. If you missed anything, you can email and you can follow up on that. I'd like to thank you all so, so much. First of all, you know, Noel introduced me to you, which was great, which is why I contacted you. But you've all spoken from different aspects, but again, in some ways directed the same thing. Noel there, almost as an icon, directing us and or directing different people, directing young people to what she saw the important thing needs to be done. And she crossed those um, important things in terms of literature and science and religion. She brought them all together and, and, and was, able to, was able to deliver on that in writing and in her work. So thank you so much for this evening. And I just hope everybody's enjoyed it. Um, from the comments, we had comments which I wasn't able to read out, but we had more comments than questions just about how much Noel has influenced people and how they wish that, like us, they could have met her as well. I'm sorry you didn't, but we said, <laughs> but thank you all again. And, thank you, uh, good night. Thank you thank for you. organizing it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.